Do you have any pets? If so, what do you have? I have a Kelpie called Buddy, and he's the best little cute puppy ever. Hello, Bridget. How are you? Good, how are you? Very well, thank you. Uh, this is Bridget Pledge, uh, osteopath from Family Wellness Group in Surrey Hills. And Bridget, you have special interests in headaches and posture, and you've just started working with some pediatrics. Is that correct? Yep, yep, that's right. Awesome. All right. So that we can get a little bit, know a little bit more about you before we start talking about some lower back, lower back things. I'm going to do mm -hmm. a fast 30 with you. Okay. So All right. uh, <laughs> buckle in, get ready. Yep. And the timer starts now. What's your favorite color? Blue. What's your middle name? Ashlyn. Where, where do you work and how long have you been there? I'm working at the Family Wellness Group in Surrey Hills. I've been there for two years as an osteo, but I was there extra two years before that on admin as well. Cool. Uh, do you have any pets? If so, what do you have? I have a Kelpie called Buddy and he's the best little cute puppy ever. Uh, what's your favourite football team? Um, Collingwood. Uh, what's your nickname? Uh, Bridge, usually. Nothing much yeah uh what's your most used social media platform or oh, probably instagram yeah what are you binge watching at the moment uh the bold type on stan oh cool uh what's your favorite meal in at the moment uh butter chicken oh, yeah. favorite thing to put on toast um peanut butter favorite drink coffee odd socks yes or no yes favorite sport to play hockey how long have you played for oh uh, how old am i oh like 16 years maybe wow uh greatest sporting achievement um coaching a winning grand final team how many languages do you speak? Just one. Favourite country you've travelled to? Um, Ireland. Have you skydived? No. Favourite action hero? Uh, Wonder Woman. Last book you read? The Grace Year. Favourite flavoured ice cream? Uh, cookies and cream. Favourite movie? She's a man. What do you listen to in the car? Uh, at the moment, Taylor Swift. What's your favourite number? 11. First job? McDonald's. Favourite exercise? Um, oh, maybe running. Why is that your favourite? Because uh, I'm trying really hard to work on it at the moment. So if I tell myself I love it, I'll get better. <laughs> <laughs> love it. Uh, what's your favourite muscle or muscle group? Um, I'd say maybe the glutes. Why is that? Uh, I feel like they're just very complex, even though it's like a pretty big muscle. They do a lot for the body. So there's lots that you can help benefit and also a lot that you can sort of retrain and help globally. Nice. Stop the clock. That's 30. <laughs> Good job. Oh, goodness. I was like, oh, God. <laughs> There's so many, like, so many of your answers. I wanted to ask you, like, more questions, but I... Yeah, I could, like, I, see your eyes. You're like, oh, cool. <laughs> yeah. No, you're the second person yeah. that says she's the man this week. Oh, That's really? That's why I was, like, giggling. <laughs> it's a classic. It is a classic. Oh, awesome. All right. Well, that's... I don't know if that's the easy part or the hard part out of the way, but <laughs> uh, let's go into talking about all things lower back pain. When you see a patient presenting with lower back pain, what's the first step you usually take when treating them? Um, usually it's assessing their range of motion. So whether it's um, like functional movements or like a proper screening, just to sort of see what we're working with, whether it's something super acute, whether it's something a little bit more chronic um, and figuring out 
what the limitation is at that point. Awesome. Um, once you've done your assessment is like, is it, I don't know, what's, what's sort of the next sort of bit? I'm just curious. Um, usually it would be like any sort of orthopedic or neurological testing. So making sure that we rule out like, any disc pathologies, um, facet irritations with neural impingement as well, and making sure that it's sort of safe to continue treating, I guess is probably the best way to put it, um, and making sure that we're not missing any major like red or yellow flags that would impact getting any sort of good results from treatment. Um, this might be tricky, but what would you do if you did think you found some red or yellow flags? Um, so yellow would probably be treat very cautiously um, and just more as a increase in just general range, probably just to keep them functioning better and then probably refer off. So like GP to get some imaging or something like that. Um, if it was red flags, it would obviously depend on which ones they are. Um, but if it was unsafe to treat, it would probably be writing up a letter, getting them to head straight to the GP or straight to the emergency room, depending on what it was. So if it was like quarter equina, so any of the bowel bladder change or saddle anesthesia, making sure that we rule that out completely before we do anything hands-on. Yeah, awesome. Um, can you think of any like particular examples when it comes to yellow flags? Like, is there something that you see commonly? Um, I guess it's I don't know if it's technically like a yellow flag but if there's an indication that perhaps there's some disc irritation impingement sort of herniation the different levels um that would be a yellow flag in just positioning that we put the patient in um the choice of treatment techniques so not going super direct to the area not you know really aggravating and inflaming the area further than what it is i guess is probably the closest thing to that yeah so you'd probably tread more cautiously with how quickly you expose them to new yeah and that sort of thing. yeah yeah definitely and like work on a little bit more of like the compensations or the protective mechanisms that are sort of like around the area rather than directly at the specific joint that's affected uh i guess what sort of recommend recommendations um would you give to a back pain client like would you send them home with homework or things to think about um yeah um definitely coming up with like a bit of a plan for them so especially if it was like an acute presentation explaining sort of timeline of events so you know it's not going to be a miracle cure overnight although sometimes we wish it could be mm -hmm. um um, you know, eventually stepping into some sort of home exercise program and whether it's stretching or strengthening in the area or the areas around it. Um, my go-to usually is always a nice big hot bath or hot shower the night after treatment um, and using a bit of a heat pack as well. Just I find more people are comfortable with heat. It's a bit more like nurturing and calming for them rather than chucking an ice pack on there and feeling like they're out in the middle of Melbourne winter um, <laughs> so yeah it'll probably depend on what level of uh, presentation they are but definitely more of like a timeline of like we're going to work together over the next four weeks and it these certain marks we're going to hopefully have achieved better range of motion reduced pain when that's happened we'll get you into some exercise but yeah generally heat and a walk or some sort of gentle movement is my first two that I go for. How do you find people respond? Like if they are seeing you with like an acute lower back in pain mm -hmm. or injury um, and they really are having trouble with that range of motion side of things, how do you find they take on the idea of going for a walk or movement at that point in the injury? Um, I would say I'm pretty lucky in that most people that I've seen super acute already had been doing some sort of activity or you know doing something with their body so they want to keep moving um the few that i have seen personally that are a little bit apprehensive they'll think that i think they just need a little bit more explanation as to why the walk is better than just lying on the couch and sort of feeling sorry for themselves yeah. um and explaining a little bit around like circulation so we want to make sure that we've got all that really good nutrients through the blood and through respiration through oxygen going to help repair the area and the best way to do that is to actually keep 
somewhat mobile. Yeah, and is that usually enough for them to go, oh, yeah, yeah, that makes sense, and I'll do some movement? Yeah, yeah, yeah. in my, obviously, just my personal experience, it's um, been pretty positive so far. I've only had a couple that are a little bit disgruntled about that, but um, as a whole, most people, I think, these days are pretty happy to keep moving probably maybe five or six years ago they might have laughed in our faces but um no I think people are a little little bit more excited to keep moving these days definitely how do you think that happened like the change five to start five to six years ago um yeah I guess I'm deep diving here but like no that's right yeah I don't know do you have any like ideas how that happened I think that in general probably allied health changed the research that they were using and a lot more research probably went into movement is beneficial. And I think that it sort of then just filtered down to the general population because more and more people hear that they should move rather than more and more people hearing that they should stay still. Yeah. I think it's, yeah, I obviously can't put an exact number on it, but I reckon that it's probably just like we've become better educated. So therefore it's slowly filtering down to everyone being more educated. Yeah, I think you've hit the nail on the head. I, I think I agree with you there. Um, yeah, well, I don't know how long they used to say, oh, yeah, you've hurt your back, you're in bed for two to th- two days to one week or whatever it was. Yeah. Like, like seeing how people respond to movement now, I just think um, how how do yeah. we do that for so long? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, we'll move on. Um do you um, often have people like patients coming in with MRIs or x-rays or scans and how do you approach um, those situations when they do have MRIs or perhaps they're wanting some scans? Um, Yeah. How do you approach that sort of situation? Um, I tend to find that it's more the older population that have already got them when they come in. Um, So whether they're coming through on like a Medicare plan, so the GP has already done all the imaging and things like that. Um, So those sort of people, I think, hold on to, I've got arthritis in my spine. So it's a lot more of explaining what arthritis is and, you know, it's not like it is a life sentence but it's not a life sentence in that you can never do anything it's just we have to adapt what you can do um with people sort of wanting scans I always I give them the choice at the end of the day it's their body and if they want to know what's happening on the inside at the end of the day it's not going to drastically affect how I'm treating or what I'm treating so if they want them I'm very open with them saying you know go for it. It might not change what we're doing, but at least you'll have peace of mind of what is going on on the inside, which none of us can see, unfortunately. No. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Do you find there's any negative impact from people having scans, perhaps in the younger populations? I don't know if you've ever experienced, yeah, someone maybe under the age of maybe 40 or, yeah, maybe under the age of 40 with a scan. And have you had any negative experiences because of uh, I've had a couple where I wouldn't say it's necessarily negative, but it's definitely like holding onto the diagnosis and sort of just letting that define what they are and what they're capable of doing. Um, so not necessarily, you know, negative towards me or the imaging itself or anything like that, but more so just like, oh, well, I've got degeneration in my lumbers, so therefore I can't do that. And it was interesting to then have the conversation of well you can do that we just have to modify it or build up to it or work with a bit of a larger team to make sure that it's 100 percent safe and that sort of thing yeah do you find that they are receptive to those sorts of conversations like knowing that they've got this diagnosis do you find that's like almost a barrier for them to move forward or can they get past it um i think that they can get past it but Uh, some people it does take a little bit longer so they yeah let it sort of eat away at them for a little bit longer than some others um and you know there's the complete opposite side of the spectrum where people are like yeah there's probably something there but I don't want to know about it so it's just getting sort of the balance of mindset for the two different groups really and yeah it just takes a little bit longer with those ones that hold on to the diagnosis a little bit more yeah Okay, um, so you've got someone that comes in with lower back pain. 
from the first appointment, what sort of expectations or guarantees or promises do you make for them at that point when they're sort of sitting there in a lot of pain? Um, do you yep. make any promises? I try to avoid promises. <laughs> um, I give them the hope that especially if it's, like you said, really a lot of pain and they're quite acute, I give them the hope that, you know, what we do today will help moderate that a little bit and help settle it a little bit. Um, but, yeah, I try to avoid too many promises about what we'll achieve in the first appointment. Um, and I just try to be really clear about, what the longer term plan is whether that's the next two weeks whether that's the next month um, rather than focusing purely on what we do do in that very first day yeah uh, are there certain expectations that you sort of set for like let's say a month um, what sorts of things will you sort of get them to expect by the end of the month if anything um, I would or not always but I would aim to just have better functional movement so whether that's still with a little bit of pain but it's more manageable um, or whether it's pain free I think is really dependent on the person I think lots of people have different pain thresholds and different levels of pain and things like that so I try to keep it a little bit more about what they're achieving through their daily life so whether it's being able to get out of bed a little bit easier whether it's being comfortable at their work desk and not getting to lunchtime and being in excruciating pain, I try to make it a little bit more about things that they can see easier through their day to day. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like those, those moments when they notice the pain is like quite debilitating. Um, yes. Giving them those expectations that those moments are going to get better and you're going to cope better with them and feel. Like yeah. Yeah. Better. Yeah, and even just like you might have it five days out of the week, we'll try and get it back to being two days of the week or something like that, you know, rather than just being in pain because I think, like I said, there's very different levels of pain that we need to um, be careful with, definitely. Yeah, for sure. All right. Um, how do you like approach a situation where you've got a patient that's been to see multiple practitioners and they've tried to get on top of their back pain, but feel like they've sort of failed and had multiple attempts, but haven't really gotten anywhere. Um, and they might even sort of put the line onto you. Like you're my last hope. Um, how can you fix me when no one else can fix me? Um, have you had situations like that? And how would you approach a situation like that? Um, I've definitely had the, I've tried everyone else situation. I haven't had the, your sort of my last hope one yet so yeah. fingers crossed it doesn't happen um, but um I always just come at it from more of like a personal connection and I just sort of explain to them that at the end of the day we need to make sure that we figure out what works best for you as an individual so whether that's osteo treatment which is you know slightly different to physio or slightly different to chiro or whether it's something more exercise based we sort of just have to figure out what that person will respond to best um i do sort of if they come to me and they're like you know i've tried everyone else i do the little line well you haven't tried me yet so we'll see what happens. <laughs> um but yeah i just i i think i come at a little bit more personally and just connect with the person because i think sometimes that can be the difference of them persisting with whatever sort of treatment they decide to have um, or having, you know, two sessions, not feeling a great deal of difference and moving on sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. How do you measure progress with back pain patients um, if, if you can measure progress with them? Yeah. So we have lots of sort of like paper-based questionnaires and things like that that can evaluate pain levels and function levels and things like that um so if it was someone that was super super chronic i'd probably use that more subjective sort of measurement um but in general i probably again bring it back to that sort of functional basis of are they able to go to work comfortably are they able to return to their sport or their hobby um are they able to pick up their kids or their grandkids and that sort of where I judge most of the progress on. Yeah, cool. Are there any sort of 
key stories that you do use to help the message sink in? Mm, not really. I don't think so. I think, you know, I would probably try and relate it back to some sort of analogy just to break down like the anatomy and the physiology of it to explain it in a way that they'll understand. Um, so a lot of the time I explain that, you know, the joints might be really stiff, but then all the muscles around it are protecting it because they don't want to aggravate the disc or whatever it might be. Um, but I probably wouldn't have just sort of one big story or one main concept that I use. I think it depends on each person. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. I think you just get told the story. So yeah. that makes complete sense to me um, how the muscles are protecting the joints. I think that's yeah a great way, to, great place to start because I don't know if you find this, but if someone thinks there's like a problem at the joint, like doing things with the muscles, they can't, like some people can't draw the connection. How is going to, how is um, treatment of my muscles or moving my muscles going to impact on the joint? And I think yes. what you've just said kind of nails that, well, they're kind of protecting the joint. So if yeah, them yeah. feeling better than the joints, I'm um, going to feel better as well. So I yeah, think, definitely. Yeah. I think, I think it's pretty great. simplistic. Yeah. And like right. in our brains, we're like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Um, but yeah, it, sometimes getting that across to patients is a little bit different, I think. So yeah, yeah. that's probably my go-to one. Um, and then if, you know, there's some disc involvement or something like that, I explained that, you know, they're like a little jelly between our joints and we have to make sure that the jelly's not getting squished or the jelly's not pushing out and things like that. But, um, yeah, I just try and break it down so it's not like muscles and bones. It's like something they could touch or they could draw and they could make some more sense of it. Okay. All right. Um, have you had patients sitting in front of you that uh, have been told perhaps something different to what, you believe in um and what be best practice medicine is for you in your mind um have have you had a patient that sort of said oh no i'm seeing someone else who said this or told me to do this um that might be different to what your treatment pathway is looking like and how do you uh yeah approach that situation um i've had a couple um and i think that mainly that's people not to generalize too much but it's people that have sort of seen one certain type of um, practitioner for a really long time or one certain practitioner for a really long time yeah. um, and I just sort of come at it from a little bit more of a I'm relatively new graduate compared to so and so so you know when they graduated definitely like that was a hundred percent what happened but research changes so so often and when I went through they actually found out that you know movement is better for lower back pain and things like that. Um, yeah. So just sort of respecting the other practitioner in a way that doesn't diminish what they've taught this patient and this patient understands, but just sort of then re-educating in a sort of like, oh, but I'm like, you, you know, new and young and so excited to learn everything and this is what I've learned sort of, <laughs> sort of stuff. Yeah, awesome. Uh, do you find they're receptive uh, or are they still sort of sitting with their um, person they've been seeing for 20 years and go, no, no, they're right. They've got this experience. Um, I, it's like a 50, 50 split. Yeah. Um, some people, again, it's sort of, you have to chip away at it over a couple of visits and, you know, get that connection with them and make them sort of show them that you're just as qualified or just as experienced or whatever it might be as their old practitioner. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, just breaking down those barriers, like one by one sort of thing. And, you know, engaging the conversation without sort of enforcing what they've recently heard. Yeah. Uh, you kind of mentioned something before, but can you think of an example of like what the actual piece of instruction was or is that you kind of gone, Oh, I don't know about that. Um, definitely going back to that. Like, you know, you just have to rest your lower back. Yeah. Um, so yeah, one man, he was very like, no, 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 I've done my back. I have to do this. I have to just rest. I have to just stay on my couch. So it was the combination of explaining that you haven't done your back. <laughs> you can't do your back um, versus what the actual injury was, which off the top of my head was a like a facet sprain. So just over rotating and just sort of tweaking through there. Yeah. Um, and then 
explaining that it's actually really good to be mobile again to get that good circulation into the area keep the muscles nice and relaxed so they don't continue to protect that joint even though it doesn't need as much protection as it's sort of giving at the moment definitely yeah and how did he go um oh it took he was very acute so i saw him like quite quickly um so by the third visit once he'd actually gone for a walk and used some heat and not just lay on his back for a week he was um definitely a little bit more open and receptive to it yeah so he had to sort of experience it for himself a little bit yeah like oh yeah yeah I, i i kind of agree with you all right uh we'll we'll finish off with one last question for today um in a perfect world What's one thing that you wish people knew or believed before coming into their first appointment um, with lower back pain? They're coming in to see you. What do you you hope that they knew beforehand? Um, I guess that it's it's not going to be an overnight fix. I think there's still a few people out there that think no matter who they see, whatever sort of practitioner they want to see, if they go for treatment, it's going to be fixed. Um, And in realistically, that's quite impossible. (laughs) Um, It might happen. It might be a lucky win. But I think just knowing that it's not going to be a quick fix and their body needs time to heal and to help itself and we'll do our best to help it along. But there's a little little more to do than just a one-hour session. (laughs) Yeah. Do you find that, uh, I guess their expectations are that they'll feel better after one session and that like they'll come in, see you once and be done with it? Yeah. I think there's a few people in the world that think that we have magic hands and we can do anything. Um, and just because it happened overnight or it happened really quickly at work, it's going to fix really quickly and it, it's not quite the same. We've got different yeah. different messages for pain in our body and they're not that quick to drop down yeah unfortunately um unfortunately yeah uh that's an awesome one though i think yeah i think a lot of us can relate to that situation all right well thank you for coming on bridget and for sharing your wisdom and knowledge with us today no worries thank you for having me 